we're going to look at the tricuspid valve uh, at, uh, in, in this um, session. Uh, and we, we, we're going to look at tricuspid uh, stenosis and tricuspid regurgitation in a little bit more detail. But the, the disease affecting the tricuspid valve, of course, include tricuspid stenosis, and it could be rheumatic fever as well as, remember, carcinoid. Carcinoid is, um, well, one of the conditions that can give you not only tricuspid stenosis, but tricuspid regurgitation. It looks as if the, the, the tricuspid valve was baked in wax, okay? And because it's so classic, they love to bring uh, carcinoid uh, uh, tricuspid valve uh, in, in exams. Tumors can affect the tricuspid valve. Vegetation from, you know, endocarditis, valvular damage from pacemaker lead. I've seen conditions where the pacemaker lead was too taut and it pressed on the tricuspid valve, giving rise to wide open tricuspid regurgitation. So, you know, those of you who put pacemaker in, uh, you, you, you know, try not to make the lead too taut. You know, give it some play because you can damage the uh, tricuspid valve. Uh, aneurysm of the sinus of valve, salva, prostatic valve, valve obstruction can affect the tricuspid valve. Uh, what are some of the signs and symptoms of, uh, so let's look at tricuspid stenosis in specific. Signs and symptoms of tricuspid stenosis because you have a blockage of blood flowing out of the right atrium into the right ventricle. You're going to get a lot of, uh, you know, jugular pulsation, fluttering, discomfort in the neck. Uh, because you're going to have decrease in your, um, your RV filling, patient will have uh, fatigue, cold uh, skin. Uh, the liver is going to become engorged and enlarged, so you get right upper quadrant abdominal discomfort because of hepatomegaly. Uh, painful hepatomegaly. Pre, the classic murmur is a pre-systolic murmur, which is heard at the left sternal border in about the fourth intercostal space, which increase with inspiration. So remember, they, they usually uh, you, when you have tricuspid stenosis, it's a blockhead. It's a, it's an obstruction. The valve does not open properly, so you're going to get a diastolic murmur, okay, or a pre-systolic murmur. The same thing. So you get a diastolic murmur, you know, can call it a diastolic rumble. It's going to hurt best in the fourth intercostal space. And again, remember that murmurs on the right side of the heart will increase in intensity with inspiration. So your, 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 your pre-systolic murmur heard best in the fourth right intercostal space will increase in intensity with inspiration, like all other sounds um, on the right side of the heart. All right, so again, when you look at the tricuspid valve, it's gonna, with, with, with um, carcinoid, it's fixed in place, okay? It's fixed in place, it's not closing, it's not opening. So you, when you look at your Doppler, you're gonna get, uh, you're going to get your, your, your tricuspid regurgitation and then your, your tricuspid stenosis, okay? So, all right, so you're going to have evidence of your tricuspid regurgitation. It's sort of triangular because it's uh, severe and you can see it's fairly dense. And then this is your tricuspid stenosis. You, if you do, if you um, trace the tricuspid inflow, it will give you the gradient, or you can do your pressure half time. Remember, for tricuspid regurgitation, uh, for tricuspid valve area, using the pressure half time method is now 220 divided by um, the, the, the pressure half time. It is 190 for tricuspid. Okay, it's different from mitral. Okay, so these are the, the features are, or these are the findings for severe uh, or significant tricuspid stenosis. A mean gradient greater than or equal to five millimeters mercury. That's when you trace the, um, the TR inflow envelope. 
CW, mean gradient greater than or equal to five millimeters mercury, the, the velocity time integral greater than 60, and pressure half time greater than or equal to 190. So when you're doing your calculation for, my, for track hospital valve area, it's 190 divided by the pressure half time. So therefore, the pressure half time of 190 or greater is significant. Using a continuity equation, if it's less than or equal to one centimeter squared, that is significant. And then supporting findings because blood cannot get out of the right atrium, so you get right atrium enlargement, um, you know, moderate to significant for if you're going to have significant uh, tricuspid stenosis and dilated inferior vena cava for the same thing. The blood is backing up. Um, so that was tricuspid stenosis. Now we're going to look at tricuspid regurgitation. Now, approximately 70% of a normal individual will pre present with some degree of tricuspid regurgitation. And to be honest with you, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a much larger figure than this. It's probably 80 to 90%. And that is why you can do, you can get a right ventricular systolic pressure and then a pulmonary artery systolic pressure in upwards of 80% of uh, uh, patients. Okay, what are some of the primary causes um, for tricuspid regurgitation? The primary causes are much less. Most of your tricuspid regurgitation is going to come from, a lot of it is going to come from problems uh, in, in the, the left heart. But anyway, primary causes, uh, you can have rheumatic involvement of the tricuspid valve, uh, myxomatous degeneration of the tricuspid valve, Epstein anomaly. So you need to know what Epstein anomaly is. Um, endocarditis, infection of the valve, leaflet tear, prolapse of the cord, or rupture, pop rupture popular muscles. You usually get this in individuals who are driving not belted in, in the car and the chest hit the steering wheel and this deceleration injury, you will rupture the cord or the popular muscle, uh, giving rise to um, tricuspid regurgitation. Carcinoid is a very testable um, condition. So it's not very common, but you know they like it on, on, on tests pacemaker and defibrillator lead. Again, if you're involved in, in, in these device placement, don't give the patient an additional uh, medical problem when you put in these device. Make sure there's enough play in the lead so it, you don't get um, compromise of the tricuspid valve. So when you have significant tricuspid regurgitation, you'll get it's a volume overload situation, so you'll get um, dilatation of the TR, I mean dilatation of the RV. Uh, secondary causes, remember we said that a lot of secondary causes for, um, for, for, for tricuspid regurgitation, a lot of that come from problems with the left heart. So if you have left heart dysfunction, um, you know, whether it's systolic or diastolic, you're going to have increased pressures. You're going to have increased uh, filling pressures, increased left atrial pressure, and that's going to transmit all the way back to the pulmonary circuit. So the patient will have pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary hypertension will give rise to tricuspid regurgitation. So a lot of the secondary causes is because of um, left heart problems. You can also get... Um, pulmonary hypertension from lung disease, okay? So pulmonary hypertension, you can get it from lung disease, uh, such as COPD, uh, uh, chronic thromboembolism, or left to right shunt. So left to right shunt, if you have left to right shunt over a long period of time, because of the increased blood flow in the pulmonary circuit, it, it changes the... Um, the, the, it changes the pulmonary circuit and give rise to pulmonary hypertension. So long-standing left to right shunt, um, COPD. So these are things that will give rise to pulmonary hypertension. And then pulmonary hypertension 
going to put strain on the right heart. It's going to cause dilatation of the tricuspid annular ring and tricuspid regurgitation. And that is why we can use, you know, in pulmonary hypertension, the, 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 the gradient across the tricuspid valve is a reflection of the uh, pulmonary pressures, okay, um, usually. And any cause of RV dysfunction, you know, whether it's a, a myocardial problem, uh, ischemia or infarction, can cause um, dilatation of the tricuspid annular ring and um, tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, so you have primary causes, which is disease directly involved in the tricuspid valve, and then secondary causes, which, you know, the valve just happens to be in the way, because if you have uh, RV dysfunction, dilatation of the, the tricuspid annular ring, you're going to have poor uh, co-optation of the tricuspid valve and tricuspid regurgitation as a result. So the signs and symptoms of uh, TR, majority of the patients are going to be asymptomatic unless it's significant TR, okay? But if you have significant TR, you can have decreased exercise tolerance because a lot of the blood is going backwards as opposed to forward. So the cardiac output will decrease somewhat. So ex decreased exercise tolerance, fatigue, ascites, because you, you will get some amount of uh, hepatic congestion and ascites. Uh, again, congestive hepatopathy, you, uh, you can get uh, enlargement of the liver and it can be tender. So when you do examination, the right upper quadrant, you get, you get, you you can palpate an enlarged liver. Uh, peripheral edema for the same uh, thing, backing up of fluid increased pressures. Peripheral edema, decreased appetite, abdominal fullness, uh, neck vein pulsation, and the the, the murmur of tricuspid regurgitations, all the systolic murmur heard best at the left uh, lower sternal border, and again it's a right sided. Murmur, so it's going to increase in intensity with inspiration. So you can pretty much um, let's go back. All right. So when when you do your echo in in majority of the um, cases, you you can determine the etiology of um, the tricuspid regurgitation, and not only. You can determine the etiology, but you can uh, determine the severity of, of the TR. And if you remember your, um, your hemodynamics, um, well, let, let's, look, let's go back and look at the anatomical uh, structures of the, the tricuspid apparatus. So the, the valve complex, um, the, the, the valve complex in, includes the valve itself, the annular ring, the coordinate tendon, and the papillary muscles, okay? So when you do your echo, you can look at any of those things. You can look at the annular ring, see what's going on there. You know, it, some patients have had repair of the tricuspid uh, annulus, so you can see that. Uh, if the, the valve is thickened, if there's rheumatic involvement, carcinoid is very classic. So you can look at that. Um, if, if there's a, a pacemaker lead, which is, uh, which is compromising the valve, you can also see that. You can look at the mobility of the leaflet, leaflet separation, the size of the right atrium, right ventricle, IVC. So you, the echo allow you to perform a complete assessment of the tricuspid valve. So in the parasternal, this is um, what we call the RV inflow view um, or partial lung axis, lung axis view of the, the right ventricle. This is an, is an excellent view. Uh, you can see the posterior tricuspid uh, leaflet and you can see the anterior leaflet. Okay, so in the cartoon over here, this is the posterior leaflet 
and this is your anterior leaflet. Okay, the right atrium is down the bottom and the right ventricle is up top. Okay, of course, your, 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 your tricuspid valves have coordinate tendinase which attach to the papillary muscles, okay, uh, which prevents the valve from um, flopping into the, the atrium. Your, your station valve is right there, and then just above that, you're going to have your coronary sinus. So this is a very important view, okay, the RV, RV inflow view. And, you know, you need to know how to get this view, all right? So the, the atrium is on the bottom, the ventricle is there. This is the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve, anterior leaflet. And in, all, in, most, in a lot of exams, they're going to ask you to label the, um, the leaflets. You have to know the leaflets because if this leaflet is traumatized, you have to tell the surgeon, uh, well, you know, the posterior leaflet is damaged and you have to describe what's going on. So when he goes to do his procedure, you know exactly what's going, what he's going to find. Sometimes when you, you're looking at your pulmonary circuit, you can do a... Uh, 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 this is a short axis view uh, at the level of the aorta, but this is a view which is a modified view so you can visualize the, the, the pulmonary valve, the right ventricular outflow tract, and the pulmonary trunk. So sometimes you have to do these modified view to have a better assessment uh, of the right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary valve, and the pulmonary trunk. All right. Um, we we had we had talk about um, you know doing the the area so you can do the area of your right atrium and we had mentioned that the nor the normal area of your right atrium should be less than eighteen centimeters squared. We have our our long axis or our, our, our a major dimension, minor dimension. So you have to you have to know your measurements. Okay. Um, so when you're assessing the, the 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 right side of the heart, so you know you you get your apical four chamber view. But if you really want to look at the right side of the heart, you have to do a modified view, RV uh, modified view. Okay. It's a four chamber view, but you sort of you adjust your transducer to look um, more on the right side. If you want to look at the moderator band, then you have to get your five chamber view. This five chamber view allow you to look at the mod, you can see the moderator band in the, in the right ventricle. Okay, so the five chamber view. All right, so again, the subcostal view allows us to, we can, we can look at it, you can see a lot of stuff. The subcostal view, you can measure the thickness of the RV wall. You can see the interventricular septum. You can see the atrial septum. And um, you can see where the inferior vena cava enters the right atrium. So you can see if there is any clots and, you know, whatever, um is happening at that junction you can see that and then with the subcostal views some patients some of your patients going to have lung disease such as COPD and you cannot do a standard uh you cannot do standard views okay you cannot your parasternal you know your you can't do your parasternal view in the in the normal area, you can't do an apical view in the normal area because the, the lungs is inflated, it's filled with hair, and you can't see the heart. So you can do a complete assessment in the subcostal view, okay? Um, however, the measurements that we use for the, 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 the normal view are not going to be applicable, but you can do a complete assessment. And this is, you can do a short axis view from the subcostal. And, um, you know, the, the things are going to be a little bit, so the tricuspid valve is going to be a little for higher up 
and the pulmonary valve is going to be a little bit lower down so you know it will be a fair you know fair for you to guys to get that in the exam as well okay, you have to understand modify a few anyway for for when we look at when we look at uh, tricuspid regurgitation we can you know is it mild moderate or severe anyway for severe tr when you look at your um or if you want to assess the severity of the tr you look at uh, your color flow jet and you have to look not only at the direction of the jet the size of the jet we look at what you call the vena contractors just like we did in mitral regurgitation vena contractor is a very accurate assessment of severity and we you can also use your PISA method just as we did for uh, TR to assess the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation so for chamber view your color your, your color doppler is across the tricuspid valve and you get some uh, some mosaic color going back into the right atrium um, you know this doesn't look very severe but you need other things to assess the severity continuous wave doppler you can see it's not a very dense jet it's not a very dense jet again the TR velocity have nothing to do with the severity of the TR. TR velocity has nothing to do with the severity of the TR. Okay, um, the density of the jet is 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 important. If it's triangular, that's also suggestive of severity. Okay. Um, and one of the most important. Um, one of the most important assessment for, for severity is looking at the hepatic vein, the hepatic vein, okay? So when you look at your hepatic vein, subcostal view, you'll get systolic flow reversal, systolic flow reversal. So if you're gonna talk about severity of TR, you have to show that you have systolic flow reversal in the hepatic vein flow. Okay, um, and just like when you have um, MR, when when you look at your early diastolic tricuspid inflow e velocity, it will be increased. Remember, we said the normal is usually less than uh, 0.7 meters per second. If you have a lot of blood going into the right atrium because of significant TR, then going forward across the valve in diastole is going to be a lot of blood. And that is uh, mani that manifests itself by a large E velocity. Okay, so E velocity more than one or, or more than that. So okay, so you you know you look at your you'll see um, this is your tricuspid inflow you know your e and a velocity just like you have on the, the left side but with significant um, tr the e velocity is going to be very high looking at your hepatic vein flow so if this would be mild mild um, mild tr you look at your color jet so the top the top panel is mild TR. You can see the color flow jet is, the area is not significant, it's sort of central. When you look at your CW, it's not very dense and it's a, it has a rounded contour. And then your hepatic vein flow, you have your systolic component, your diastolic component, the atrial flow reversal. As opposed to severe TR, you have, the, 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 it, the, the color goes back more than, uh, you know, significant, uh, more than 40% of the atrium. And then you have a dense triangular contour to your um, TR envelope. And then when you look at your hepatic vein flow, remember your ECG is always there. So you have systolic flow reversal, your diastolic component, atrial flow reversal. 
this is so-called normal hepatic vein flow because you, you, the flow is away from the transducer, hence it's below the baseline. You have your systolic component, diastolic component, atrial flow reversal. Okay, so when you talk about severe TR, you have to show hepatic vein flow. What about the pulmonic valve? I mean, that's yeah, that's neglected quite a bit. Uh, you should, you know, have, look at the, the, the pulmonic valve um, because you know you can have uh, you can have a stenotic valve. The 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 pulmonary trunk can be dilated, so you have you you know don't ignore your pulmonic valve. Uh, completely but the pulmonary valve separates the right ventricular flow tract from the pulmonary artery from the pulmonary trunk three leaflets you have a left a right and an anterior okay as you're in your aortic you have your non-coronary there is no coronary to talk about because coronaries don't come off the pulmonary um the, the pulmonary trunk Okay, so you have your, your, your left, your right, and your anterior. These are thin mobile structures that open in systole. Uh, the, the, Doppler, the Doppler spectral is a systolic flow pattern, peak velocity usually less than 0.9 meters per second. Uh, pulmonic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis. Um, a lot of your, your pulmonary stenosis is going to be congenital. You know, patients who have tetralogy of uh can have branch pulmonary stenosis. So, you know, you, they may have repair, but in your evaluation of these patients later on, you're going to find, you, you'll find that you'll have evidence of pulmonary stenosis because they are branch pulmonary stenosis patients with Noonan syndromes. So there's a lot of condition that can give rise to um, pulmonary stenosis. As again, it's mainly congenital. Um, the normal is a tri-leaflet structure, but you can have bicuspid, unicuspid, and dysplastic. Um, or you can have obstruction below or above the valve, just like you have in the aortic um, condition. You can have a functional stenosis um, that is, you can have something, a tumor, for example, in the right ventricular flow tract, which obstruct the right ventricular flow tract. So you get a functional stenosis. Um, you, you can have hypertrophic uh, or infiltrative processes that can um, affect the, 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 the valve structure as well. So signs and symptoms of, of pulmonary stenosis, um, it depends on, you know, the age of presentation. But anyway, you can have cyanosis, uh, fainting spell, because any condition where blood cannot uh, get out of the heart, or, uh, you, you know, fainting spell is a, is, a, is a small child, failure to thrive, shortness of breath. Uh, a lot of patients, however, are asymptomatic. Um, when you listen, uh, you'll get a, a, an ejection murmur, usually in the left, uh, uh, power sternal uh, second intercostal space. So, you know, the, 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 the pulmonary area is the, 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 uh, the, the, the second left intercostal space. That's the, the, the pulmonary area. So when you listen over that area, you get this ejection murmur, okay? So echo is very important in determining the severity of uh, pulmonary stenosis. You can also use echo to determine the site of the obstruction and to some extent the cause, and you can quantify the severity. So you can look at the parasternal short axis at the level of the aorta. Remember that the, if you look at the, the, on the right side, you're gonna see the, the, the right ventricle flow track the, the pulmonic valve and the pulmonary trunk. Uh, you can also do your parasternal lung axis, RV outflow and subcostal views to, to look at it. The grading of uh, pulmonic stenosis is, um, 
is important. And the reason why pulmonary stenosis is of interest today is because we can treat these individuals with, with balloon valvuloplasty. This condition is very amenable to, to balloon valvuloplasty. You get a valve in and you open it up and the patient do very well. So the grading for your pulmonary stenosis, severe pulmonary stenosis, the velocity usually greater than four meters per second. The gradient is usually greater than 64 millimeters mercury. And, you know, so these are criteria to do a valvuloplasty. And uh, the results are usually very, very good. Okay, so severe and then mild, you're talking about P velocity less than three meters per second, gradient less than 36 millimeters mercury. All right, pulmonic regurgitation, very, very common. 80, 90% of your patients gonna have minor degrees of uh, pulmonary regurgitation. Uh, severe pulmonary, pul pulmonary insufficiency or pulmonary regurgitation. Uh, we usually see this after some type of surgical repair. So your patients who have had tetralgia fellow and they have had repair, a lot of time when these patients come back, you'll see they have severe uh, pulmonary regurgitation. And over time, that severe PR can cause RV dysfunction. So severe PR, you know, is a is one of the is one of the condition you, you you should repair. These patients should repair. If you if you if you neglect these individuals, they can present with RV dysfunction. So some of the causes of pulmonary regurgitation, carcinoid, you know, carcinoid tend to affect the tricuspid and the pulmonic valve, it can cause stenosis and regurgitation, carcinoid, rheumatic, uh, dysplasia, vegetation prolapse, pulmonary hypertension, um, you know, problem with the, 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 the valve structure, the motion of the valve. Um, okay, so when, when we look at pulmonary regurgitation, we have to look at everything, just like in tricuspid or mitral regurgitation. You have to look at the valve itself. Is the valve thickened? Is the valve perforated? You know, so you have to look at the valve structure. You have to look at the motion of the valve. And then you look at the pulmonary trunk and the bifurcation to see what's going on there. You look at the RV size and function and the right ventricle flow tract. So, you know, if you have significant PR, you have to look at the whole op, uh, pulmonary apparatus, so to speak. So again, short axis at the level of the uh, aorta. And when you look at your, so for mild pulmonary insufficiency, you see, you know, a very faint jet. So with C doubler, a very faint jet, and then you're not a very significant slope. So your, your slope is not very significant as opposed to significant PR. You, you, you get a very dense jet and a very steep slope, okay? And then these patients with severe PR will have evidence of RV dysfunction. The, you know, the, the, you may have dilatation of the RV or, you know, RV dysfunction. So significant PR can cause problems. Um, with the color flow, you can establish the, the origin of the jet and you can do the vena contractor. Uh, remember, vena contractor is a very uh, accurate means of assessing uh, regurgitation. You can look at the, the, the jet length, um, among other things. Um, so to assess pulmonic regurgitation, you know, of course, we have mild, we have severe, anything that falls in between is moderate. So for, so for severe PR, okay, the, the, the valve is usually abnormal. So you're not, you're not going to get severe pulmon, pulmonar, pulmonic regurgitation with a normal valve. So the valve is usually abnormal. So we said before, usually 
patients who have had tetra tetralogy for low with a repair or some other congenital problem and they had a repair. When you look at the RV size, RV is going to be dilated. That is why you have to get in the habit of measuring the RV. And then we look at the jet size by the color flow, usually a fairly large wide jet um, brief in duration. When you, when you look at the, um, the, 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 the jet density and deceleration time, as we showed you before, you're going to get a dense uh, jet uh, with a steep deceleration. Okay, and then um, when you look at your pulmonic systolic uh, flow compared to the um, systemic flow, uh, it's greatly increased. So again, when you look at your PR, so you know you're going to get uh, a very steep deceleration time, a very dense uh, envelope. Look at your color. You know, but you're going to put everything together, though, not just you're going to have evidence of RV dysfunction. You're going to have RV dilatation or, you know, you might do TAPS or some other method of assessing RV systolic function is going to be reduced. As opposed to a mild PR where you have um, the pulmonic valve, usually normal, the RV size, usually normal, color jet, um, very small color jet, and then of course a faint density. The the the, 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 the the steepness of the D of the slope is not very great, and um, so so you have you know the mild features, severe features of our PR. You have to know what's severe. Um, there are structures in the RV that if you don't know that they're there, you'll diagnose all sort of stuff. And one of them is the eustachian valve. So the eustachian valve is the remnant of the embryonic valve of the inferior vena cava. And it enters the, um, the, the right atrium. And of course, some, a, lot of, a lot of patients will have this remnant. A lot of patients will have the eustachian valve. And it's commonly mistaken for, 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 for masses, thrombus, and stuff like that. So in the fetal circulation, the, 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 um, the embryonic uh, valve of the inferior vena cava, it acts, as, it acts to direct oxygenated blood through the fossil ovaries to the left atrium. Because remember, the, the, uh, the fetus don't have a function in lungs, okay? So um, the, 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 the left side of the heart have to get oxygenated blood from uh, some other means, and this is the means, okay? The oxygenated blood is directed through the fossa ovalis uh, into the left atrium. Um, the eustachian valve is uh, is best visualized in the um, subcostal view uh, or the uh, parasternal lung axis view of the, the, the right ventricle, or we'd say the RV inflow view. The RV inflow view or the subcostal view; these are the two best views to to look at the eustachian valve. And again, it's a horizontal linear structure from the entrance of the IVC to the uh, inferior border of the right atrium. So, I just sort of drew, drew something to exaggerate what it is. So, again, this is your IVC hepatic vein; it'll be right there. Right atrium is right there. Sometimes. You know, it might be a thickened structure. Sometimes it looks like little strands floating in the right atrium. Sometimes it looks, you know, it, it, it can be very significant. So you have to know about the eustachian valve. Okay, so um, we gonna, f so that's basically, what, we, what we'll do is um, the next few sessions, we're gonna,